Brickyard 44, 67, wind 200 at 10, runway 31 left at Kilo Echo, clear for takeoff. Titanic is arguably the most famous ship in history. The events surrounding her sinking make a perfect story, which sometimes seems more like a Shakespearean play than a historical event. With so much attention paid to this story, Titanic herself is often overlooked. She was not an especially remarkable or innovative ship, other than the huge gap in size between her and the next largest class of ships. For this reason though, looking at Titanic from a technical standpoint provides a good insight into ocean liners of the era. Here are 10 technical Titanic facts. 1. The White Star Line planned to build the Olympic-class ships in response to Cunard's Lusitania and Mauritania. Cunard's two giant liners were fast, each capturing the blue ribbon. Their speed was due in part to the new type of engines installed on them, turbines. White Star's previous ships had been built with the traditional triple and quadruple expansion engines, which did not produce as much power, but were reliable. White Star had a dilemma. They did not know which propulsion system to install on their new ships, which needed to compete with Cunard and the German liners. Meanwhile, Harland and Wolff was building two identical sister ships for the Dominion line. Even though they were identical, one ship, the Albany, was fitted with the traditional triple expansion engines powering two propellers. Her sister, the Alberta, was fitted with a more complex system, which included two triple expansion engines, but also a turbine engine which powered a third, central propeller. Seeing an opportunity to test the two propulsion systems on two otherwise identical ships, White Star bought Albany and Alberta, renamed them Megantic and Laurentic respectively, and placed them on the Liverpool to Canada joint service with the Dominion Line. Megantic and Laurentic were put to the test at sea. By June 1909, it was clear that not only could Laurentic achieve higher speeds than her sister, but she could do so more efficiently and at a lower cost. So it was decided. Olympic and Titanic would be triple screw ships powered by two triple expansion engines and a single turbine engine. Two. Like all ocean liners, Titanic burned an immense amount of coal. Even when not at sea, the ship needed to keep the lights, heat, and hot water on for crew and to conduct maintenance and other necessary work for the operation of the ship. Additionally, since it can take six hours or more from the time of lighting the boilers to having full steam pressure, boilers are sometimes kept lit even when the ship is in port. Titanic arrived in Southampton on April 2, 1912. For the next week, while she waited for the start of her maiden voyage, the ship burned 415 tons of coal. 3. As with all iron and steel ships of the time, Titanic was constructed of a rib-like frame. This served as the skeleton of the ship. Metal plates were riveted to the frame, serving as the skin of the ship. For the hull to be watertight, these plates had to overlap, not unlike the shingles on a roof. This overlap inevitably resulted in a hull that was not flush and smooth, but Titanic was built with larger than usual plates to minimize the number of butts and overlaps on the hull. The plates varied in size at different points along the hull, but they were between 30 and 36 feet long and 6 feet wide. Before the plates were riveted to the frame, they were moved into place temporarily, secured with bolts in every second or third rivet hole. 4. In 1911, Olympic became the largest ship in the world. At 45,000 gross registered tons, she exceeded the next largest ship, Mauritania, by nearly 50%. Olympic's time at the top, though, was short because her sister, Titanic, was launched in 1912 and Titanic came in at 46,000 tons. In other words, Titanic was 1,000 tons bigger by the metric of GRT, which is the standard for measuring the size of ships. Titanic's dimensions, though, aren't really any different from those of Olympic. Gross register tons is a measure of volume, not weight. Specifically, it measures the volume of enclosed spaces aboard a ship. Olympic was designed with two promenade decks, one on A deck and one on B deck. But the White Star Line realized that, for whatever reason, most passengers simply used the A deck promenade. So the open promenade on B deck was essentially wasted space. Titanic's design as a result was changed, extending the first class cabins on B deck out to the side of the ship and creating the Cafe Parisian which also extended to the outside of the ship. 
All this newly enclosed space in the design is what made Titanic technically bigger than Olympic. Before we get further into this video, I want to remind you to hit the subscribe button. If you're interested in transportation, history, or both, you'll want to know when a new video is posted. If you have something to say, make sure you leave a comment below. Okay, back to the video. 5. Titanic and Olympic were 882 feet long. At this length, the ship could span multiple high waves simultaneously. This would lead to flexing of the ship's hull and superstructure, called either hogging or sagging, depending on the scenario. Hogging occurs when the ship is sailing over a wave, but the bow, stern, or both are extending beyond the length of the wave and into the trough behind or ahead. At midship, the hull is supported by the wave, but the bow and stern are relatively unsupported, causing hogging. Sagging occurs in the opposite scenario, when the bow and stern are supported by two different waves, leaving the midship unsupported within the trough between the two waves. To reduce the stress on the ship, expansion joints were incorporated into the design of Olympic and Titanic. These expansion joints were essentially splits in the superstructure that allowed the different sections to move slightly independently from each other and reduce the amount of flexing. An intricate system of leather strips between the joints kept the ship relatively watertight, and any water that did work its way in between would be caught in a channel designed for this purpose. Olympic and Titanic were built with two expansion joints each. Olympic, though, experienced significant cracking, so the design of Britannic, the third ship of the Olympic class, which was not yet built, was modified to incorporate five expansion joints rather than the two on Olympic and Titanic. Six. In order for the ship to optimize stability and performance while at sea, it needed to have the correct draft. The draft of the ship, of course, could change depending on the weight at any given time. Since the weight was not always the same depending on what the ship was carrying, ballast tanks within the double bottom could be filled with various amounts of seawater to ensure the ship was sitting properly in the water. Weight varies between voyages, but also between different points along the same voyage. As the ship burned coal and its occupants consumed and otherwise used its fresh water stores, the ship would become lighter and rise out of the water. To counter this, more seawater would be pumped into the ballast tanks to ensure stability. It is well known that Titanic's fourth, aftermost funnel was a dummy installed mostly for aesthetic purposes. The Olympic-class ships only needed three funnels for their boilers, but four funneled ships at the time were associated with strength, safety, and style, and so a fourth was installed. Titanic's fourth funnel, though, did serve a purpose. It provided ventilation to the lower decks, reducing the need for bulky and unflattering ventilators up on deck. Additionally, this funnel was used as an exhaust uptake from the engine rooms, many of the galleys, and the fireplaces. Speaking of the fireplaces, there were many aboard Titanic. The smoking room, first class lounge, and the reading room all had fireplaces. Even many of the first class staterooms had fireplaces. Only one of these fireplaces, though, was functional. The fireplace in the smoking room burned real coal to create a real fire. The two in the lounge and the reading room, though, were entirely aesthetic, and were installed because the architecture of those rooms called for a fireplace as the centerpiece. The many fireplaces in the staterooms, though, did produce heat, but it was electric heat, just like the heat supplied to the rest of the ship. 9. As was the case with other White Star liners, Titanic's propellers were not made of a single piece of cast iron. Instead, Single cast iron blades were bolted to steel propeller bosses. Propeller blades were frequently damaged and sometimes lost at sea. Ever aware of cost, the White Star Line realized that it was simpler and cheaper to replace single blades rather than the entire propeller. Since many of their ships used the same size propellers, the blades were interchangeable, and a reserve of spares could inexpensively be stored on shore to later be installed on a number of their ships. 10. Titanic was steered by an 80-foot rudder constructed of six cast steel plates. The rudder weighed over 100 tons, and no amount of mechanical advantage could allow it to be manually turned. Therefore, an engine, powered by steam from the boilers, was used to operate the steering gear. Spur and bevel gears, each being 6 feet in diameter, turned a large quadrant which attached at the head to the tiller and, in turn, to the rudder. Each ship had two of the engines that powered these gear systems, but only one was used at any given time, the other being a backup. All of this equipment was stored under the poop deck. 
In the event of an equipment breakdown, the tiller could be turned directly from the wheel on the docking bridge, located on top of the poop deck. There are many fascinating items I could discuss in this video, including many that I'm not aware of. Do you know any lesser known facts about Titanic's design, construction, or operation? If you do, leave a comment.